Okay, so I guess most of the people are already here. If anybody is late, he will come later. Uh, okay, hi, my name is Yuri, and first of all, thank you for coming here, and thank you for choosing this course. As uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff mentioned, we are very excited that uh, there are so much people here. And as we are that big crowd, there is no time to, for, for everybody to uh, introduce himself, so I will do it just myself. And then later, uh, during the course, we will get to know each other better. Um, so I'm a I'm, uh, data engineer. I work for Wicker Lime and Robotic. I have six years of experience uh, in a difference of uh, uh, development fields, one way or another related to Scala. And this summer I attended uh, data science school in this university uh, and I must say that I completely fall in love with this place. So I'm very proud to be here right now. So what would be, uh, what is the goal of this part of the course, of this first uh, practical uh, part in Scala? Uh, this would be to make you proficient enough uh, to build the pipeline in Kafka, but even more than that, uh, I would say is to give you the, the sufficient amount of uh, knowledge in Scala so you can use it to uh, work with other applications as well. Uh, so simply putting, I would say, to make you love Scala. And um, the outline of this part of the course would be uh, like there, there will be like five, five uh, sections, uh, every in uh, two in each uh, in two weeks. And first of all, we will go through the Scala language basics, uh, through the syntax, and uh, the goal would be to make you able to write simple things in Scala that you uh, already can do in other languages that you use right now. Then we will go through the functional programming and how we can do that in Scala. And then uh, we will go through the parallel and concurrent programming on the GVM and how it can be implemented in Scala, uh, different patterns and usages. And having that knowledge, we can proceed to more complex subjects like ACA actors and ACA streams. And like, and going through some more closer to real life uh, applications. And this is kind of a baseline of material we would like to cover. And depending on our velocity, we will see, maybe we will extend or reduce the scope a little bit. So I want it to be like a conversation between me and you. And when it's get too boring, you tell me. And when it gets too complex, you tell me also. So um, this is, uh, how, how it is going to be structured, this is going to be like a mixture of lectures and, uh, and practicing, uh, listening, seeing, and then typing on the keyboard. Uh, and yeah, so usually while explaining some complex subject, people tend to uh, go through the theory first and then do practice. Uh, but I think in our case we can do we can refine this approach a little bit, and the thing is that our brains are like simple things. So the goal is to give uh, to build an intuition first, to give something very simple to our brain, and then do some practice to make that intuition stronger. And then uh, then this, this is going to be a natural process for our brain to build. Uh, this extraction around this intuition by itself. So uh, to, to, then we can go through the theory and then return again to practice and then repeat the cycle. So I think this approach can work in this case. Uh, so we will be following this. So that was about uh, the Scala part of the course in general. And for today's Oh, we are going to start from answering the question, why Scala? Uh, why Scala may matter for you as a data scientist and why it matters overall? Yeah, 
then we will go then we will speak a little bit about programming languages about what Scala is actually and what makes it so special what uh, language design decisions make it so special um, the first this, this is going to be the first part of today's uh, class the second part will be dedicated to the uh, hands-on and going through the syntax uh, of Scala and doing some a little bit of programming yeah and first of all why why you may need Scala actually so as you might see on this slide uh, Scala is not completely like on the right uh, it's not just data engineering it's somewhere in between it's in the bottom by the way uh, so the reason is that there are pretty pretty a lot of things written in Scala for the data science uh, in particular there is a spark ml lib as probably everybody uh, at least heard of uh, there is a deep learning library for Scala called deep learning for Scala uh, pretty nice thing uh, there is a library called breeze used by statisticians and there is a whole bunch of other stuff and while we're speaking about data engineering, uh, right now Scala is considered like de facto uh, language for the big data uh, ecosystem overall. Uh, Spark Kafka is implemented in completely in Scala. Um, I, I'm, uh, I would say like most of the uh, big data frameworks at least have the Scala API uh, and a lot of them have pieces, some pieces written in Scala. And I'm not even talking about not big data related things uh, like microservices, REST APIs, or even simple control applications uh, written in Scala. A lot of people consider Scala uh, like hard to adopt, hard to learn uh, because of its complexity and learning curve. But I would not uh, call this a drawback. I would just say smart language for smart people and we are smart people here, we are data scientists. So from my own experience, I can say this is one of the most, if not the most versatile and powerful languages uh, right now, uh, existing right now. So Scala can be scary and at the same time beautiful. So this is a code snippet from uh, one of the libraries that I like. Uh, and seeing this for the first time and trying to figure out what is going on here is can be painful and scary, but when you get get uh, used to it, it becomes really beautiful. So this is not the code we are going to write. This is just uh, the scariest example of Scala code. Okay, Scala. So what is so special about it? What it what it hides in its name? Okay, scalable language. So probably it addresses scalability program, pro problems. And I would say that this acronym is not a coincidence. Uh, as you might uh, see from the Jeff slides, uh, Jeff slides uh, the year of creation of Scala is 2004. And this is the year when uh, MapReduce uh, computation model appeared. And uh, the creators of the Scala languages, the Scala language, uh, had this scalability in mind when designing the language. So this is a, his, a little bit of a history on the uh, on this language. This is uh, Martin Nadersky, the designer of Scala. Uh, so he formerly worked at uh, on Java compiler design and design for a Java generics language feature. And this slide you have probably seen on the Jeff's presentation. This is a Moore's law visualization. And looking at this for some time, it's, uh, it should be pretty intuitive. Like we have uh, a time scale on the X uh, and uh, CPU frequency on Y scale. And this, and this uh, our gray area, this is where we got the uh, speed up for free. The CPU frequency, frequency um, priced and, but at some point, multi-core CPUs appeared and at that time, uh, people had to transform their uh, algorithms, their problems, rewrite them to adapt to this uh, 
multi core CPUs uh, to write them in a parallelized way. So this is the era of parallelism. This is where the, the era of parallelism started, basically. So, uh, and more than that, at the same, at the same time, um, the amount of data and the uh, size of the data sets uh, grew and it forced people to do two things, to parallelize and to distribute. So Scala shines well, so well to address such kind of problems, but why? I would emphasize this in these five statements. Scala is functional language. Scala is also object-oriented language. Scala is statically type language. It runs on GVM, compiles to bytecode, and it has special features uh, that uh, I call, so which makes it language really special. So down the road, we will uh, unfold each of these statements to develop better understanding of, uh, of the language design and uh, how it impacts the application, uh, the applications of the language. Yeah, so right now we, we will kind of develop intuition around these two concepts. So uh, let's speak a little bit about programming languages overall. So you probably, uh, you, you already seen uh, some information paradigms on the Jeff slides. So there is a, such a kind of, uh, such a definition that paradigm in science uh, describes distinct concepts of thought patterns in scientific discipline. I would say this is too abstract definition and we can define it in an easier way, uh, like in a more intuitive. So programming paradigm is just a programming style and the language is an instrument uh, that we can use to, uh, to program in some particular style. If language permits to do that, if language features, syntax, and language design permits us to uh, write programs in some particular style. So basically, certain instruments better suited to certain styles uh, because they were developed within uh, those styles in mind. And there are some examples of uh, programming paradigms you already seen, but I would concentrate here on these first uh, two sections imperative versus declarative programming. So there are some examples of languages. Uh, and if you think a little bit, you may notice a difference. So the examples of declarative languages are, can be HTML, XML, SQL. So what you do basically, you in, in usually in declarative programming, uh, for instance, in HTML, you are describing the output uh, of, a, of a, the structure of a web page, the output of it. And in imperative programming, you are a little bit more specific. Uh, usually you are more verbose in describing how the algorithm works. You are working with uh, memory, communicating with underlying resources, et cetera, et cetera. So you are basically closer to the underlying system. And this can be emphasized in the two, uh, two words, two, in, in one word to each of these uh, styles. So imperative uh, programming answers question how. Basically, uh, we are telling computer how to do things. And in the declarative programming, we are asking him what we want him to do. For instance, when we write an SQL statement, we are basically telling computer what you want your computer to return to you, not how to do that. We are not interested in, in that, we are abstracted out of it. So we are basically operating on higher level of abstraction in this case. Yeah, so, and the functional programming is a kind of sub-genre of declarative uh, programming. And there are some examples of functional languages that you already seen and for multiple reasons that we already discussed here, uh, functional programming uh, had not been so popular for a long time, uh, although existing for like 50 or even 60 years already. So to summarize, imperative programming is about modifying mutable variables which can 
uh, we corresponded to memory cells, undefined memory cells, reference variables, which is like loading, CPU load instruction, and using assignments like CPU store instruction. So this is very close to hardware. And the problem basically arises when we are trying to scale up. So uh, one smart guy said, how can we avoid conceptualizing programs word by word? And what he was, uh, uh, what he meant here, uh, he, he actually asked the question, can we be less specific about, uh, can we be less specific when we are doing programming? Can we abstract over the underlying uh, implementation. So usually people consider two kinds of uh, scaling, vertical and horizontal scaling. Vertical when we are increasing uh, uh, the sources of, of, uh, of a one particular node, one computer. And horizontal when we are basically adding uh, more nodes to the, to the system, to the cluster. But even within one node, they can be multi uh, core CPUs or even multi CPUs. So saying that our program is scalable, uh, when we are saying that, we are basically saying that it should perform effectively uh, on a multi multiple CPU <coughs> units or across the cluster, uh, it should perform effectively. Yes. Functionality contained in Scala. <coughs> And this functionality of expanding to multiple nodes is uh, inherently built into Scala. Uh, I would say that Scala suits very well to address in such problems, and there are approaches and uh, libraries, frameworks we will see later that can uh, abstract you uh, very well uh, over the this internal uh, hardware and uh, internal. Uh, implementation basically. Uh, so we will see later. This is not like a build on the language level. This is uh, what language allows us to build, uh, like libraries built on top of the language. Uh, so it's very well such kind of problem. So writing programs for uh, concurrent and distributed systems is hard. And one of the biggest problems here is mutable state. And for that reason, in Scala, there are two kinds of things. I would not name two kinds of variables because there are two kinds of things. There are, there are values, there are variables. And the thing is that um, variable is mutable and value is immutable. And by saying immutable, we mean that it cannot be reassigned later. So once we declare it, it cannot be reassigned. So, uh, from a mathematical point, uh, standpoint, this makes a lot of sense because in mathematics, uh, we don't do reassignments or there, there are no mutations in mathematics. We are just declaring functions and operate uh, with uh, expressions. So, function programming, we can simply put in four statements. Uh, function programming is when there are no mutable shared state when functions are values the same way like strings uh, or integers, this is the same kind of value and we can pass it around, uh, perform some operations with it. Uh, in the pro programming language terminology, it's called first class citizens. Uh, program is composed of functions. Uh, so this basically means that we are building something bigger from smaller parts and it's called composition. And in terms of functional programming, the whole program is like a single function, single big function composed of smaller parts. Uh, and program should satisfy particular laws. The same way, uh, like in a mathematic uh, function, uh, for instance, class function satisfies associativity law. The same way functional, uh, functional program written in functional programming style uh, should satisfy some particular laws. And this is uh, basically how we can define a simple function in Scala. So this looks very similar to a Python, I guess. 
uh, there is a keyword def and then the name of the function, argument, its type, return type, and the actual implementation. So as you might remember, Scala is also object-oriented language, and it means that it supports uh, the three main principles of uh, object orientation, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Also, everything in Scala is an object, and every function called, uh, every function called uh, in this context is also a method call in terms of object orientation. So uh, this means functions are like methods in uh, object-oriented programming. And you may notice that uh, those both definitions, uh, there, there are no conflicts between those uh, two definitions of functional and object-oriented programming. So they can be used simultaneously, basically. They are orthogonal in other words. So uh, this is what I meant uh, about paradigm that it's applied to the uh, to a style, programming style, and in this sense, we can mix both styles at the same time uh, because Scala allows us to do that. Okay, uh, third item here is Scala is statically typed language, and this is not less important. So, Python, R, JavaScript are uh, examples of dynamically typed languages. Uh, Java, C Sharp, C++ are examples of uh, usual examples example of statically typed languages. And um, I would ask you a question: What do you think? What is the difference between how uh, programs are executed in those languages? Like program executing in Python and program executing in C++, for instance. What is the difference between execution? Types of execution. Population and yeah, you're right. So yeah. that's basically the thing. Uh, if language is statically typed, then there should be a compilation phase because without compilation phase, you, this will not make any sense. Uh, the static static check, uh, the, the checking of uh, che type checking should happen at the, uh, some at some at some point in time, and. But actually, dynamically typed languages, uh, there can be some compilation as well. As I know, in Python, you can compile some pieces to make it more performant. Is it right? Yeah. So, uh, and there is something um, about this. Uh, yeah, you can see the, the example. Even if you have the mutable variable in Scala, you cannot reassign it to some other value, some other type. So the impact of this uh, language design feature is that uh, it actually increases, uh, increases scaling possibilities as well. Because uh, when we have a big amount, a big program with a lot of components, each of the components has its own interface and it exposes it in a static uh, manner. So they can integrate better between each other. So usually it takes more time to write such programs in statically uh, typed languages, but it's less time to maintain. Yeah, so to summarize, statically typed when uh, types are known at compile time and dynamically typed when it is associated with the value at runtime. So in Scala, you can write explicit types like that you can explicitly state the type of the value uh, and you can omit this explicit statement. And in this case, this will be called the uh, type inference. The compiler uh, will actually infer the type during compilation. So uh, the compilation in Scala is basically multi-stage. There are like 22 stages of compilation. Uh, and on the first stages of compilation, the compiler, compiler will refine basically your program with types. And then on later stages of compilation, it will check them. So this is how it works internally. And this feature is called type inference. So to summarize, in statically typed program, programming language, uh, the compiler is a validity check 
it validates types uh, one when application compiles and some people even say that once application compiles it is ready for production so in a purely functional uh, meaning it makes a lot of sense actually uh, but in any case this is a first level of defense uh, against errors yeah and type inference may yeah. uh, is there any possibility in Scala to create dynamically type variable like in C sharp there is dynamic keyboard maybe something like that in Java you mean the variables that you can assign any any type of value to? any type of value and uh, call any method from this variable like this and it will not fail on the compile time well uh, as for types, there is a, like a top uh, type of hierarchy. So you can declare uh, the variable with that kind of type and assign any, anything to that. Uh, and as for dynamics feature, like uh, calling any uh, method on that object, yeah, there is support for that. This is uh, like considered like re restricted feature, something that you can actually declare, uh, define an object without any methods and then call any, uh, like, no, it works in another way. Uh, we can cover it later, but basically, yes, you can define some object and uh, call any method on it. It will, there, there is such, such a possibility. I will go through the, some of the special features later. Um, so in terms of uh, scalability, in terms of uh, static typing, uh, the Scala can be seen on this plot, like uh, there is less time for initial development speed, like in dynamically typed languages, but better scalability uh, because of that uh, static, uh, because it is statically typed. So being a functional declarative language, in Scala, every, almost everything I would say is an expression. And expression in this uh, context has the same meaning as a mathematical expression, basically. And the process of combination and interpretation of those uh, language elements, which substitute expression, is called the same way like in mathematic the expression evaluation. So for instance, if else uh, construct in Scala is expression, so it returns some type, some, some value. And to feel the difference, you can look at these examples. And this is not only about this is one line and this is multi-line. This is a different kind uh, of, of expressing the same thing, basically. In the first case, we have expression on the right side. And in, in the second case, uh, we do it in a more imperative way. Right? Like every line is a statement, basically. So, so this is, again, how we can, the syntax of value definition in Scala. So we have a name type, and on the right uh, side, we have expression. And this is right expression can be basically anything. For instance, a code block or if else statement, function call, basically anything uh, which, which is called expression in Scala. Sorry about that. Yeah. So code blocks, which are defined with curly braces uh, is an expression in Scala, and you can use it anywhere where expression should be used. If else is an expression. For instance, in case of if else, you may notice that in the parentheses, we have a green expression. So we can even put the code block, which returns uh, a blue in result. So um, in this example, uh, the last line of each code block will be a return value uh, of the target value on stu. And the type of, the, uh, of that last statement, of the, uh, the last expression, is the type of the target value. Yeah. So this is how it works. And function bodies is also in expressions. So you can put the, any, uh, the same way any kind of expression. And the definition of function syntactically uh, looks like that. You can omit 
the result type actually. The compiler can infer in most cases the result type, so you can omit it. But usually it's a bad practice to uh, omit that even if it uh, can be inferred, because it can be a source of confusion. Yeah, and there is no return. The re return statement is optional in Scala. The, the, the last line of the, uh, the code block basically will be the return uh, value of the expression. Yeah, and not less important, the fourth statement here is uh, Scala runs on GBM and compiles to bytecode. So uh, what it gives us, it gives us uh, Java interoperability uh, out of the box. We can use uh, its ecosystem, big data ecosystem, which is really important. And, uh, and it does a cross-platform, so we don't need any, anything to install, only GVM, basically. So this simplifies the uh, deployment procedures as well. And the last one, but not the least, uh, what I would call the special features, and this is kind of a chocolate chips in the cookie, I would, I would say so. This is what makes Scala really special, in my opinion. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it adds this dynamic language type of feeling. Like, uh, for instance, first one is Grapple, read, evaluate, print, loop. This is something that exists in most dynamically typed languages. Like in Python, you write Python to the command line and then just execute Python expressions. Yeah. So, this is the same uh, kind of thing <coughs> with Scala. The next one is very controversial. A lot of people uh, doesn't like it implicit, but I consider it like one of the most powerful things in this language. And in fact, a lot of libraries use, uh, use this feature a lot. Implicit uh, macro support. This is even more controversial probably. Uh, and, but it's also used a lot by the framework. For, for instance, in Spark, uh, some of the essential functionality is written using macro support. And macros is basically means that this is a program which generates code. So this is a Scala code which generates Scala code and then it compiles. So this is like meta programming, so called. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so is this like macros in list? Are you familiar with macros in list? Yeah, actually the macro. Uh, so it's not a uh, macro in C++, right? No, 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 it's not macro in C++. Uh, yeah, this is this is a code generation support. It's a compile time. So this is uh, at, at compile time you can execute some code which will generate uh, more code and then compile it. So and it can reduce boilerplate like a lot. And yeah, this is a great feature. You can do advanced type level programming using uh, some of the techniques some of the language features available in Scala. This is, this is, you can do crazy things about with that. Like, uh, you cannot even imagine to do in other statically typed languages. Uh, Duck type in a Scala language dynamics, this is uh, what uh, you asked about uh, this. Uh, this is a support that you can use to, to have this like, kind of dynamic uh, typing. Uh, string interpolation, interesting stuff. Uh, you can basically write SQL where there are libraries which support it. You can write an SQL query which will be type checked at compile time. Yeah, so the thing is that being so powerful, uh, this, all these features are not enforced by the language. So you may use it or you may not use it. Uh, this is kind of optional. And the same goes with a functional programming purity, I would say. So functional programming purity as an option. You may use uh, immutable values and fewer functions, or you may not use it. It's an option. Okay, so what do we have about time? So this is what's like the first part of our classes. We can use uh, a short break if you want. Okay, so uh, now comes the hands on part and has, it, has everybody installed the software, uh, the instructions I sent yesterday? 
I, there are no uh, any problems with that? There was problems. Ah, okay. There was problems. So what was the problem, the biggest? Maybe <clears throat> the biggest problem was that at last part of your instruction, it wasn't very detailized. Uh -huh. so you can yeah, okay. in process. So about that. Yeah, it's always, uh, I hate doing this like for uh, instructions of installing something that always, always has a problem. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I will open the IDM that I have to mirror my display. Configuration, we should run uh, Scala console or Scala script in IDEA? Uh, which configuration you mean? The main in your How? project, like the main configuration. <laughs> okay, let me open the. Uh, the in your package. And there is a configuration main at the top right corner. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you mean this one? Yeah, it's the Scala console or Scala script or uh, what should be? Don't pay attention to this. This is not going to be used. Like at, at this class, this is not going to be used. So first of all, I would like to show you the uh, the console basically while we uh, before we uh, come to the IDE itself. So uh, I will create a buffer. Yeah, so that's what I was talking about, the REPL. There is such thing in Scala and you can just type Scala if you install it and this and you will enter the interpreter basically and this supports all kinds of things like you can import, uh, for instance, you can import random from the standard library. You can define uh, some values, functions. Uh, yeah, it supports auto completion. If I'm writing some, yeah, some import, for instance. Yeah, so this is like a basic stuff you can do with uh, Scala. Just enter a REPL and do some quick prototyping, writing a function, evaluate an, an expression, stuff like that. Yeah, so I would return to slide for a minute. This is hard to switch between mirroring displays. Sorry about that. Mm. No, this is not what I use as a separate, yeah. Oh. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is the kind of slide when we will see that means uh, there's going to be hands-on. Uh, yeah, so that was about a REPL. You can uh, use special commands, which starts from the uh, from this sign, uh, double double bill sign. Uh, I forgot the name of that sign. Uh, yeah, but actually. Uh, yeah, you can use println and stuff like that. But in the IDE, there is uh, the similar thing exists, uh, which is called worksheets. And I will return, uh, oops, sorry. Hmm. Okay, I will return to the mirroring. Yeah, so if you, if you uh, have pulled the Git repository yesterday, uh, you should pull it again. 
there will be update, uh, updates with the uh, worksheets. So the worksheet is basically like a Jupyter notebook. You can think about that. So this is, uh, I'll create a new one. Style worksheet. <laughs> Yeah, just, just try to create a new worksheet by going into the folder and picking a new style of worksheet. So in this worksheet, you can type uh, any commands and they will be uh, interpreted on the right side. For instance, I can define a variable. Oh, I will make it bigger like that, yeah. I'll hide it for a minute. Yeah. So you can do any kind of things, like for instance, when I define a function. It will be displayed on the right side. The, 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 the function definition, the same way as I may do in the REPL the console, but in the ID it's a little bit easier to do, of course. So, uh, is everybody okay with that? Is there any problems with the? Uh, okay. Now turn to slides. Okay, I should do something to the about the new related classes. Okay, so speaking about primitive types in Scala, this is pretty obvious stuff. There is uh, like a standard set of primitive types, green, white, short, in, and one thing worth mentioning here is, is that string is a sequence of chars. It's treated in Scala as a sequence of chars. Yeah, so this is quickly to recap on how we define the values and variables. And you can actually do that uh, thing in the last row. You can define, uh, assign one value to multiple variables once, define multiple variables. Yeah, and once you, once you want to uh, define a literally state, the type of the literal, like you want a long value, you just add L in the end of the number. Or the same way with double or float. And you can have hex numbers as well. Yes, and in that case, if you have two numbers like that, one double and one long, the inferred type would be the super type of both, like the most uh, uh, specific type of both. In this case, it's double. So that's why uh, type inference can be confusing uh, in some cases because uh, we are not seeing the actual type. And you can also cast like that. Uh, once you want to convert into the long, for instance, you can just uh, put it like in the first line. But you cannot do it with string because Scala is statically typed. So when, when you have a string, a number in the string, you have to use something like that in the bottom. You have to uh, convert it to integer uh, explicitly. Oh. What happened? Sorry. <clears throat> Okay. 
sorry about these technical problems. It's like uh, first time I experience with these uh, neural <laughs> problems. Uh, okay, so this is a quick recap on if else statements. And uh, this is like a obvious stuff you can do in any programming language. I mean, this looks the same, pretty much the same as in Python or any, any other language. Uh, the only thing to, to mention here is that uh, there can be um, and and or signs, as you may see here, they can be doubled. And in case if they are doubled, they are short circuiting. So that means if we have like false and uh, true, like a statement which uh, relates to false and statement which relates to true, and there is N in between them. The second statement will not be evaluated because uh, there is a false in the first place. So it will quickly return, which called short circuiting. So this is something that worth remembering while, while uh, writing code. Sorry? Yeah. So what is the difference between um, one person and two person? So that's what I'm, uh, okay, I will just show you on the desk. So for instance, if you have something like, Looks like it is invisible marker. Yeah. I'll try this one. Can you see it? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Maybe you can do it in your yeah. 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 I just I just show you in the code. Because whiteboard is cool, but yeah. But switching between uh, displays is a hell, I must say. Okay. So for instance, you can do something like that. Like. Yeah, so this should work actually. Oh, yeah, sir. Yeah, I should put on something here. Yeah, so you see the second statement was not evaluated at all because this is a short circuit. First statement evaluates to false, there is no reason to go further. <coughs> Because it's an so, Well, this is a small, small feature, which. But if you write one in percent, this error will. It should. It should be. Yeah. Uh, let's try it. Yeah. So that's a, that's the difference. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Now I should open it once again. It's a help. Okay, this is simply how we can define a list. So we, this is very obvious syntax, I guess. This, this, uh, this is called the list builder. So we are, um, actually in this place, the function is called, but uh, this is the one kind of uh, list definition. Another kind is using this double, uh, double dot, a cons operator. Uh, operator. This operator uh, is named cons. So you can kind of uh, chain the the definition of the, the, the values together, and they will uh, compose a list. Basically, you can write uh, zero cons two cons three cons four. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like if you want to create a list for one five. Is there a way not to list it actually? Yeah, there is a way we will cover it just in a minute. 
So you you are reading my mind. So this is on the next slide. Uh, yeah, you can do concatenating list, and this is like operations which are very intuitive uh, uh, with list. Yeah. If we are adding an element to the head of the list, it produces a new list for us because it's stored in the variable list one. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there are two kinds of collections in Scala. We will cover it tomorrow, actually. But there are immutable collections and mutable. Uh, these are by default, without importing specific uh, explicitly. This list is uh, immutable list. So once you perform some operations on it, the, the new list is created, basically. And yeah. And the for loop, this is something special for Scala. Uh, and internally, it's a little bit more complex than uh, loops for the fir from the first glance. But basically, uh, this is how it looks. This is the, uh, you have an identifier. You have this uh, kind of error, back error, and you have a sequence. So you basically assign uh, this identifier for each element of the sequence, and then you have an expression. So S uh, should be a traversable type. We will go through the collections uh, tomorrow. And this is how ranges can be built for for loops. This is very declarative sy syntax, I would uh, say. So it's something like that. So on the right hand side, we have built uh, the range, which is a traversable collection. And we uh, iterate and read, assigning uh, each of the elements to identifier i. Uh, let me. Oh. Okay. Okay, and this statement, this is expression, but it doesn't return anything, basically, this for expression. And to return something, there is one more keyword to that. Uh, which is yield. And when you specify this yield, the type of the result will be the same as the type of the sequence. And you will be basically yielding the elements to collection, which are related by that expression on the right hand side. So for instance, in this case, there are going to be uh, all of the squares from one to 10. We are yielding J. Yeah, so let's let's do some small let's do some small exercise basically. Let's return to IDE. Um, something very, very simple. And there is a week one X one. So using for loop build the list of squares of this list. Just open this X1 and where these three uh, question marks are, you substitute it with, the, uh, with your implementation. And who will perform this? You can post it in Slack, like who will be the first one. This is, this is going to be very simple, I guess. Where you can find slides. Okay. Sorry? Where you can find slides. Yeah, I can, I guess, I can export them, but this is going to be a problem probably. Mm -hmm. You mean slides so you can follow slides and uh, use the. We'll look in syntax and use it. Yeah, you're right. This is a separate. <clears throat> okay, I will send the slides in uh, five minutes. We will have a <coughs> assignment and I will contact you to do this uh, expert.
yeah. So this was very basic example. And let's do a next exercise. There is the next exercise number one where we can generate random list. So, uh, yeah, let me. I will show you just uh, until we have slides uh, exported. I will. Yeah, so write a function for uh, which for a given number uh, returns a list of that length. So this is going to be something like that. And the thing is that you can import in any way in the Scala pro program, not just uh, in the doc. You can do it right here. And you can do, uh, you can import a, an exact function like that. So you can actually rename it, for instance, there is something uh, called import rename. So in this case, I'm yielding just like that and yeah so this generator one to length is basically building a range which is not a list and to convert it to list we have to specify it uh, explicitly like that yeah I will just send it to slide so this was some of the very basic examples and now we can move to more complex stuff. Yeah. So let's use the four comprehensions that we have seen already to do uh, that kind of filtering. So as you might see, um, Yeah. Maybe ask that question about the first exercise. Yeah. About the random dispatch. Uh, first question: What is next int uh, equal arrow next? Where you import the scala into the other language? What yeah. So uh, that's that's what I basically uh, went through when writing this code. Uh, you can do imports like that in scala. You can. Uh, Oh, sorry, I'm not sharing this. Uh, yeah, so you can do import like that, for instance. This is uh, the same way you do this probably in most of the languages. In Python, there is the import statement, yeah? Yeah, so this is, uh, I'm importing the, the whole class like that, but I can do uh, like that, I can import the particular function and use that function in this scope. So I'm, I was just showing that you can do the, this kind of renaming if you like. Oh, it's you can, it's yeah, you just rename it. Okay. Yeah, and, and you so can do this on the any level. You can. So it's kind of as a Python. Maybe as I'm as not uh, quite sure about okay. Python. Yeah. Yeah, this is like uh, that kind of import. Okay, so this is a second question. Why i is undeclared without val or, or why is it? Like? This is uh, the four comprehension syntax. Yeah, so the four comprehension syntax uh, <coughs> means that every line in me has uh, some specific to four comprehension syntax. So you are using this arrow 
I guess in our language there is some kind of thing, and you don't need to write well. You, well, if you would uh, write it so, uh, it will call you this is it will say to you this is an error basis. A uh, twist is a massive. Why don't you call it a uh, Sorry? Why don't you call it invention? What do you mean, call it? Uh, yeah, this is another thing about syntax. You can omit parentheses if uh, if there is no uh, arguments for that function. So this is a function without arguments. And uh, to navigate through the standard library, you can use actually, well, <coughs> yeah, this is a function without any arguments, so you can you can even uh, place parentheses here because there are no parentheses in definition. If the function, yeah? You also can delete parentheses at the next function. Uh, yes, yes, that's true. In the next uh, function call, you can delete it, use it like that. What next does it? In this case, uh, this is the renamed next in function from random. Okay, what does next in do? Yeah. So, when we go through our iterations, an iterator doesn't matter. The return type is also what we go through, yeah? For example, yeah. like the sequence of the integer, that's why we um, uh, should. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if I would specify, let's let's do it this way. So, can you see my screen clearly? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, if I write it like that, let's resign this uh, to some variable. Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, mentioning that the for comprehension is an expression itself, so this evaluates to some value. And to specify, you can actually, in IDE, uh, there is support with the hotkey that you can use to specify uh, the exact type. So IDE will help you with that. And this, on Mac, it's option plus enter. I guess it's alt plus enter on Windows or Linux machines. And you can use it just to, to have this kind of thing, add type annotation to value definition. It, this helps a lot uh, in some cases. Or you can just, uh, there is another hotkey to inspect the type of the return value. Yeah, so this goes a little bit beyond our today's scope. Uh, this is another type of collection. It's more uh, general than the list. List implements sequence. So if you, are, uh, if you, if you want here to return a list, we have to convert explicitly. Oh, yeah. The question was more of like what impacts on the result type of this mm -hmm. for sequences. Because in previous case, where we got uh, those uh, yeah. just L by L by list, mm -hmm. uh, it just the reason was just because we were iterating through the list, so in result we got this. And if you are iterating yeah. through the sequence, the sequence we got sequence. Yeah. Yeah. So it's always, the only reason what what is return type is. Uh, the source, what we are through, yeah. yeah, the, the, basically, uh, the, the, the result of iteration would be the same. Uh, the most general type of, the, of those yield uh, expression. Well, the, the yield expression returns the, the exact value, and the type of a collection that we are iterating on returns the type of the collection. So if we are iterating through sequence, then uh, we have a sequence in output. If this, uh, we can convert this one to list here, and then we will get a list in the output. Yeah. Then remove this. Yeah. Would you please explain what the yield statement is? Because, for example, in JS or Python, there is the idea that when you use yield, you like freeze the execution of function, and then you could call it uh, after like several 
mm, lines or whatever. But uh, here you just continue to uh, iterate through a list without any uh, like freezing. Well, it's not about freezing. It's just uh, a keyword that is used to specify that we return in, we have, have something to return from this iteration. We are yielding the result. Like, uh, okay. yeah. So we can omit it and then, uh, for instance, let's say this one, this example. Yeah. We can omit yield and then you will see what will be the result. Like I have to put some expression here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the result type of this one would be unit. And unit in Scala is something like void in Java. There is like no type, basically, no value. Okay. Okay, so is uh, everything clear at this point? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we will skip this exercise because it's basically pretty much the same as previous one. And let's go to this simple assignment. So let's try to write a sum function in terms of, uh, first of all, in, in terms of while loop. There is a while loop. I will return to slides in a minute. Uh, and then rewrite it using recursion. So there are two numbers, A and B, and we want to build a function which can uh, sum numbers from A to B, natural numbers from A to B in a recursive way. Give me two minutes, I will um, <coughs> export slides. everybody is ready with the solution, uh, you can post it in Slack. for the space like B is less than A and such thing or just ignore it? Uh, no, not in this case. Just feel free. Okay. Okay, you can download slides and post to the channel. Um, yeah, <coughs> that was the right, the right one. Somebody already posted a uh, code snippet in Slack. Yeah, so this is quite basic recursive function. 
Um, Actually, I wanted to ask you a question about the workshops and how can we approach this? Because this is new to me and I have a few options on my mind. This is, can be like, I'm giving the, uh, I'm writing code myself and showing you how to do things. Uh, or either giving some simple assignment and you do this and ask questions. Uh, or somebody from the auditory can then go for come up with a solution, go and explain to everybody else their solution. Like, what, yeah? Yeah? Okay, so. If you don't understand, you, you, you probably understand this. So then you can explain, you will improve your solution. So I think it's. Okay, we will try different kinds of uh, different approaches. So, is everybody clear with the uh, solutions that Voldemar posted? Okay. So. Let's return to slides and go through some uh, mm -hmm. some more syntax on the function definitions. So this is a gener general uh, way you how, can, how you add, how you define a function. You have a function name. The uh, thing worth mentioning here is that the return time uh, the return type is optional. Yes, and you can have multiple arguments. This is obvious. Yes, and in this case, the type of this function is considered to be like a string, uh, two strings into one string. So this type will, will uh, uh, when we speak about function as a value, this is the type that this value gets. Having this function, uh, this function corresponds to value with such type. And we will see later how we can define function as a value, basically. You can have default arguments in functions, uh, as in the most languages. You can, can have named arguments. So uh, this is some tricky thing uh, to notice is uh, the plus, actually, uh, this is a function which is defined on the number of plus. So, uh, number one is an object, and this object has a function plus. And in Scala, we can uh, omit dots. We can, when we are calling a function, we can omit the dot and just write in this infix notation. So. This looks very declarative, very declarative to me, uh, actually. When you can write code in that in that way, and uh, this will look like a, I don't know, like a sentence or something like that. Yeah. What if the few arguments is just with the comma sign? Uh, if there are few arguments. Then you should uh, you, you cannot use this in fixed dot notation. Mm -hmm. You can do other things. There are such things called caret functions. Uh, we will go through that in the in, in the third class, basically, in functional programming. But you can do a caret function and then supply uh, argument one by one, basically. So that's what that's what you can do. Yeah, and this is how you can define anonymous functions. So uh, you are specifying the argument and implementation on the right side. So this is a function without name. So it's kind of long the version. Yeah, this is a kind of, you will say lambda functions, uh, closures, anonymous functions. Uh, I would say anonymous is pretty much the same like a lambda 
uh, but in terms of uh, meaning, the, in terms of meaning, basically. Yeah, and you can omit the type. In that case, type will be inferred. You can even omit the argument itself, and this is called placeholder syntax. So these, all these definitions are uh, similar. Yeah, and the function body is an expression, as we already uh, learned. So this is kind of fu uh, function syntax you use when you uh, need to supply function to some other function, to supply function as a value. For instance, when you do operations with list, for instance, a map function, you uh, supply the, uh, the map function in that, uh, using that syntax. You can do it in different ways. <coughs> yeah, and having this uh, anonymous function definition, this, uh, this definition is basically an expression too. So you can take this and assign to some value. And this would call, this can be called the uh, uh, function value syntax kind of. And in this case, the type of the function of these functions that we are uh, talking about here is int to int, like this, this is syntax we use to define the type of the function. So, okay. And yeah, the, some people we use the word closures, but closure is basically the fact of capturing the state, the alter state into the function, into the anonymous or not anonymous function. So this is the fact of creating closure, but this is just called an anonymous function, basically. You can nest functions as well. Uh, so as any kind of, uh, expression basically like you can nest full blocks um, so the same way you can have nested functions and having that nesting in Scala uh, there is uh, the, the, the behavior of uh, variable names is the same as any other language and it's called lexical scoping so and this is the chain of uh, prior the priority the compiler follows when uh, we have uh, the same definitions uh, with the same name. So first of all, we look into local definitions and explicit imports, then wildcard imports and packages. Packages we will uh, cover tomorrow. Okay, so. Uh, do we have actually, how much time we left? 15 minutes? Okay, 20, okay, nice. Actually, we are behind the schedule, uh, so there will be more work tomorrow, probably. Okay, before going forward, let's do something before. Yeah, so we already defined the function to some integers, yeah? What about defining a uh, function which can sum squares of those values? Like uh, having a function of squares, define a function of some squares. So we, can, we can actually go a little bit further because we have no time. Uh, Let's let's just write a common function which covers this this use case.
So we just need to apply functions on every operator. Yeah, basically, yes. It's almost the same for most. Yeah, if you complete this, you can try to uh, write the, the same function in terms of map and reduce functions on the list. So you may see on the slides uh, some of the basic functions that are available on the list. And you can transform A to B to the list in the way we already learned. Here, a different syntax can be used, so we can write like that, yeah? And we can do shorter syntax, basically passing the function itself, because uh, map signature requires a function from int to int, and we can pass just a function to the value. So this syntax is yeah, the same as this one. In this case, in Scala, we can just, uh, do you see my screen, by the way? Yeah, yeah okay. Because it, uh, every time it does it, the uh, resolution is zoom. Uh, well, yeah, we can use reduce directly, basically. Uh, yeah, but then there can be interesting syntax for reduce. We can do something like that. So if the function takes two arguments, yeah, uh, if the function takes two arguments, we can use such syntax. This works for use, for instance, and for some other uh, common cases. And this would correspond to the uh, to such a, to, to such anonymous function like this x plus y. So this is the same kind of function, but it will not work if you just want to do something like uh, uh, like that. It will not understand what. What do you what do you want from, from the compiler? But uh, if you specify the type, it will work. Well, no, it, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, ah, well, because I defined the wrong type. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this this way it works. And it's secrets in the same position. I mean, like first variable is always first underscore. Yeah. If I want to change them, I can do that. No, you can do that. So this would work for, uh, yeah? How do, like, should it be first to reduce and scale something with maybe if I finish a while? Would it arm? No, in this in this case, uh, this this is a kind of reduce when we just take the first element and then, yeah. This is and it's always like right? no. There are there are different kinds of reduce. There are reduce left when you uh, specify the the initial. Well, no, uh, there is. No, that this is the, the way the reduce works. With, but there is a fold operation when you specify initial value and then the apply operation. Yeah, because if I like for unreducing some place for some components object, some function process, but it's not like obvious how to do it. What you do in the place where that reduce something. So you don't pass there. Like can we somehow pass the initial value? Uh, then you can you can use fold oh, for that reason. Yeah. So that's uh, what I mean what I mean. Yeah, and then there are Right, so this is yeah, like some other languages. There is like reduce works with initial values. It's basically the same kind of operation, just yeah, different name. Reduce, fold, yeah. 
And this is something about quantum programming. There are different uh, names for, for the same stuff. Everybody named uh, different. You said that we can use uh, only reducing this example with underscores because we can't uh, wrap this underscore with a function. No, we can. Uh, I just wanted to show okay. you the syntax. Yeah, we can. We can just do like. Ah, you mean wrap underscore wrap with a function? Yes. No, you can't do that. It will not work like. Uh, something that you okay. will not understand. The compiler will think that this is the argument of the function f. Yeah. Well, just example. It just, uh, you mean what is the purpose of this function? Yeah. It's just an example. There are simply a function which uh, sums elements from A to B and applies a function to it. So this is, uh, yeah, it's a boring example, just to learn the syntax. And as you can see, uh, a lot of questions arises from this. Uh, because in order to do some, some more advanced stuff, uh, you need to understand the basics uh, of this tricky differences in syntax. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it should not. It should uh well. If this is immutable uh, already, it will not require it will not be required to uh, to uh, allocate new list because it's already immutable. It just wraps it with a different interface, with a different access uh, interface. So the data in the memory will look the same. It just uh, will be wrapped in the uh, in the list class with a different API. A to B, uh, actually, it's a range. Yeah, we are going a little bit uh, forward into the uh, collections, basically. And the range, if you look at the class itself, yeah, it extends a sequence. Well, this is how you can uh, navigate Skullstand library, I should show you. So on the Mac, it's command plus arrow. Uh, uh, but plus uh, plus click basically you just uh, hold a command and you can navigate to the uh, definition of that particular element yes and arrange implements a sequence but then we should go through the hierarchy of the collections and we will do it tomorrow so for, uh, for no, we can to, uh, to make a list from the from the uh, Well, we don't need a list actually here. We can map directly. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, you're right. We can map directly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay, can we move forward? There is some uh, some time left for uh, we can go through pattern matching in Stella. Well, so much time. Okay, so this is a <coughs> uh, syntactic structure, the same as a uh, switch case in Java, for instance. And in Python, probably something like that switch case. Is there something like that? No. No? no. Ah, just if else, okay. So in Java exists such, such thing like switch case. And in Scala, 
uh, you can think about that just to understand uh, better understand what is going on here. So this is the uh, construct that you can use to match the particular expression to different patterns. So you have the value of some expression and compiler will, uh, like not compiler, but program will run through the uh, check one by one and find the check that satisfies, uh, the, the check that satisfies the expression basically. And you can have the if expression here and different kinds of patterns. So the last one is like default case in Java, for instance. Yeah. And first match will win. Uh, the execution will not uh, go further. And if there is no match in the case, this will lead to much error at the runtime. So this is simple example with values, but patterns can be uh, more complex than just uh, simple literals, strings. Uh, we will see later, for instance, you can pattern match a list. So you have a list and there can be different uh, cases. So the nil value, oh, sorry. The nil value is basically the empty list. So in this case, we are matching this input list uh, is an empty list. And in this case, this pattern means that we are unapplying list uh, into the head and its tail, into the first value of the list and the rest of the list. And in such way, we can retrieve, for instance, first element uh, of the list. This is kind of syntax we can use to do that. And the yeah? tail variable always has the keyword. Uh, no, it's basically a, a variable. Uh, we just don't have it here. Sorry? We just don't have it here. No, the the compile the, 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 the ah. syntax match case syntax will assign a value to the head and a value to the tail. And the value of head, this is the same like I would state val head equals the, the head of the list, something like that. So if this case matches the input list, because in this case it will match. If I would have the empty list, it will not, it will match the first case. If I have that kind of list, uh, it will match second case, and then it will be deconstructed, the list will be deconstructed into the head and the tail. And the tail is the list also. Sorry, like, and it's like only first element would be with such syntax in, in second case type. Yeah. Uh, and tail, would it be type of list from two to five, or would it be only five? In, in just no, this in is going to be. Tail is last element, or tail is everything except head? Yeah, it's everything except head. <laughs> yeah. And you can do more than that, you can change those. Uh, those uh, th that structure, like you have, you can have head, head, uh, second, head, like first, second, third, fourth, then tail. So you can match one by one. This is useful uh, syntax you can use in uh, recursive functions, for instance. And you can as well uh, pattern match while you are doing the value definitions. So this will work the same way. For instance, if you want to retrieve uh, the first element or pattern match uh, the whole list, you can use such syntax. Yeah. And this, uh, there is one more thing called tuple. Uh, and tuples are basically the containers of values of arbitrary values. You can, uh, you can use it to store any, any series of values, like uh, static series, not, uh, uh, not a, a, like a container to storing data, for instance. You can think about the uh, data set or data frame uh, in a Python or R. Yes, and you can also pattern match on it. 
For instance, if you want to return uh, more than one result from function, you can use double this very quickly. You just wrap into parentheses and you return uh, uh, all of the values that you wanted to return from function. I'm sorry. Yeah. So we can't declare double this bar keyword because they're mutable only yes. I know. Uh, well, there is a different kinds of immutability here. Uh, well, let me switch to the ID. This requires some more explanation again. So, um, when we define value, it is basically immutable in the sense that I can't reassign uh, anything to it. Uh, yeah, and when we have a tuple, tuple, yeah, it's immutable by, uh, but even if I de uh, define the uh, tuple this bar keyword, for instance, one, two, three, I cannot change the values in tuple. I mean, I, I cannot do such kind of thing. This is, by the way, the access pattern to the value in the tuple. So, so it doesn't matter how to define a double. Yeah, no, you can change the whole double. You can oh, you okay. can change it to something which uh, have the same type because type of the double you can look it look up it like this. So uh, is everybody aware of this key, uh, shortcut to specify the type? You can use Alt Enter in the IDE, and it will sorry. Uh, no, Alt Enter or Option Enter. This can be very useful to inspect the type uh, when you do programming. Yes, so you can you can do something like that, for instance. But the tuple as a structure itself is is immutable. But what yeah. you can do, yeah. Does it have some methods? Uh, yeah. Actually, a tuple. Uh, yeah, it has it has methods. Yeah. So this is the uh, syntax you use to retrieve the values one by one from tuple. There is a method called copy, and this is exactly the case when you want to change something in tuple. You uh, change a particular value, you uh, use the copy, and it constructs a new tuple with a changed value. So you can use it like uh, two, something like that, yeah. This creates just a new tuple. Yeah, this creates a new tuple. So uh, by itself, tuple is immutable uh, by design, basically. Uh, yeah, we will go, uh, we will dig deeper into this uh, tomorrow, we will see what the tuple really is. Yeah. And if you want to drop some value, for example. Uh, to drop some value? What do you mean drop some value? Yeah. You're doing a tuple, but without a second tuple. Ah, this one uh, is not that simple in a, because Scala yeah, is statically typed. Mm -hmm. But you have uh, such libraries like Shapeless, for instance. Uh, the code snippet that I show you on the first slides. Uh, that, that is a library which allows you to do everything. And for instance, because you, you get a different type. So that was a tuple of three values, and then you have a tuple of two values. Okay. So uh, the time is, uh, the, the lecture basically is finished. So we have a few more assignments. Uh, you can do it at home, basically. And we have one more topic that we had not covered yet uh, on tail version. So we will do it tomorrow, probably. OK, we can continue in Slack if there are any questions. Uh, I will post a list of uh, assignment, assignments uh, as your home assignment. OK? Yeah.